Writing Out Loud. A program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very special guest today is Pulitzer winner Richard Risa. Thank you so much for being here, Richard. It's great to be here. Yeah. Your first trip to Oklahoma? Um, I think I've been to Tulsa on maybe one other book tour, but it was a number of years ago. Yeah. So yeah. It, it all seems new to me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you're yeah. here in the spring, and beautiful yeah. weather without tornadoes. Yeah. One of the things that's so interesting to me in your books is that they often focus on the parallel lives that we imagine for ourselves, the parallel yeah. narratives that we do. And it's fun to kind of look at your books and watch that dynamic at play between different books. And I thought you might contrast the obvious the not-so-obvious differences between the father-son relationship in Nobody's Fool and the father-son relationship in The Bridge of Sighs. Oh, um, yeah, the father-son, I, 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 early, early on I was doing a lot of father-son yeah. son book uh, stuff, uh, Risk Pool and, and Nobody's Fool were kind of reverse father-son stories. Yeah, One was yeah. father-son from the point of view of the son and the other is uh, yeah. Nobody's Nobody's Fool was then the, more the uh, point of view of the father. Yeah. Um, and I think that those, those books weighed um, rather heavily um, on, uh, on my own experience with mm -hmm. my own father, mm -hmm. who was, uh, I've been tracing rogue male characters throughout, <laughs> <laughs> throughout my novels. Yes. Uh, and um, Sully was one of those, one oh, of those charming, yeah. wonderful, Rogue males. Uh, when when my mother read that book, she uh, uh, she kind of smiled and said to me, "I like him so much better in your books." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that's the testament yeah. of success. Yeah. I mean, it was real. It was yeah. you, you captured that. So, but but then by the time I got to Bridge of Sighs, I, I, like most writers, my work becomes a little bit less autobiographical. Mm -hmm. I I think in a way, or mm -hmm. or or, auto, or autobiography takes a different contour or a different spin it comes out a little bit differently but in in bridge of size what i was really looking at was a situation in which a son can be so devoted to his father mm -hmm. the way lucy lynch mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. with big lou and big lou is just a wonderful big old yeah cuddly bear of a man Probably not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but he makes up for that <laughs> with a with a kind of of generosity and optimism that I, as as the author, found uh, found quite winning, and I could understand why Lucy would be so um, uh, enamored of his of, of his father. But that kind of love, um, I think, causes in causes in Lucy a kind of blindness kind of blindness about the world because his father's mm -hmm. not always right but he mm -hmm. but he thinks this he cannot he cannot contemplate the possibility that his father might be wrong about anything and of course it, it causes him to uh, miss his mother's contributions and her virtue exactly. almost almost completely and yet we're so attracted <coughs> to Sully in spite of his honoriness you know and it's fine yeah in spite yeah. of his did you get a good handle on him right for the, from the beginning, or did you discover him at a deeper level as you were in process? Almost always the latter. Um, I have, at the beginning, I have a character that I think I know um, at least a little bit about. Um, I don't like to begin down a four-year or five-year road of writing a book if I don't feel like I know anything mm -hmm. about the character mm -hmm. at the beginning, but I invariably find, find that there are uh, layers to be peeled back. Um, and the and the character uh, is much more complex than I imagined him to be. Mm -hmm. And while I did draw for a certain uh, to a certain extent on my own relationship with my father uh, in in that book, Sully very soon became somebody that wasn't my father as mm -hmm. well. I mean, mm -hmm. I was taking certain things, but I find it difficult to 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 tell literal truth about anything or anybody <laughs> for very long. I start embellishing. I start. Um, uh, uh, improving upon things, uh, making things up, and pretty soon Sully had um, had a character of his own, um, and he was marching. He was marching to his own music, and then of course Paul Newman came along. Yes, yes. And the first, I had never met. Obviously, I had never met Paul Newman before that. We were traveling in exactly the same circles, uh, but I met him on the set, and uh, he came limping toward me. This they hadn't started shooting yet, but. Uh, but he was already in character, limping on, on limping on Sully's bad leg, 
Um, and he had begun by that point, of course, uh, with a great actor to inhabit yet another character. Mm -hmm. um, so it was there was a real metamorphosis in, in uh, during the during the years that 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 book got written, and then and then that Newman portrayed him. And I get confused now when I go back uh, and look at. Um, Look at the movie, and I and I look at the book, and I'm so f and I'm so fond of Robert Benton's movie mm -hmm. that I get confused about what was originally in the book and what did Newman do new in the movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you think of Sully now in your mind's eye, do you see him as Paul Newman? I do now. I did not at the time. Um, when I got the call from the producer saying that it was going to be Paul Newman, I know well, Sully's that good looking. I, <laughs> I had described him. Um, I had described him as I had in, I had in mind, you know, when you go to Mexico, they have those 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 tall, elongated sta wooden statues of Don Quixote mm -hmm. yeah, with yeah. a very squat Sancho Panza mm -hmm. <laughs> on mm -hmm. his mule uh -huh. uh, right next to him. That elongated uh, figure of of uh, very tall, very thin, very emaciated, very kind of scrap iron. Uh, Guy that I described in Nobody's Fool. I suppose if you were casting by what I had, what I had written in that novel, probably would have been closer to Roy Scheider than Paul Newman. <laughs> but the great thing about a, a, a great actor is that that um, you know they just they it, it, what's going on inside is so much more important <laughs> than what's going on mm -hmm. outside. And you, you only had to see Paul in about the first three or four frames of that movie to know how great he was going to be. Another interesting overlap in your novels, of course, is the focus on small town life. And mm -hmm. in The Bridge of Sighs, Lucy, I believe, is the one who refers to the intense pleasure of the familiar. I love that, yeah. that line. Can characters, can people live up to their full potential within such narrow boundaries? Well, you know, I ought to be able to answer that question because that's what that book is about. Mm -hmm. uh, whether, whether people need to do what what uh, Bobby Marconi does, the other boy in that yes. book, flees that, flees that small town and, um, um, uh, and, and never returns. He's, he's actually scared to return mm -hmm. he, because, of, because of the way he leaves. Mm -hmm. In some ways, Lucy, who lives his entire life there, um, his life has been circumscribed in a way, but I'm not sure that it's the town that's done it. There's, what, his life is circumscribed, mm -hmm. I think, in ways that are um, uh, that are partly his nature, uh, partly his partly his own character, and of course, as a very young boy, he was locked in that trunk, and something happens. Yeah. Something yeah. happens to him in there, and the and the the smallness, the, the um, his being confined in the, in that trunk made him need, I think, uh, a small world. Uh, something mm -hmm. happened to him there that made him take enormous comfort in doing what he calls his rounds every day. Mm -hmm. He goes to the same places and he stops in at the same diner and he does he does all of he does all of these these things. Um, so I think it's the cruelty that was done to him as a child and um, some things that are probably inherent in his own character that have that have kind of circumscribed his life uh, every bit as much as mm -hmm. as the town has. I think Thomaston is actually pretty good town. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think another person's life might not have been circumscribed quite as much as Lucy's has been. And I know people. I mean, I, I come from a small town in upstate New York. I've lived in small towns all my life. Um, and, I, and, I, and I don't believe you have to go to the city. I don't believe you have to go to Paris. You don't have to go to Venice. You don't mm -hmm. have to go to London mm -hmm. or New York uh, to live um, rich, wonderful, uh, um, full lives. Um, uh, but Lucy's life has been, I think, circumscribed by events. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Certainly. Very well said. I was reading the acknowledgments to this book. I'm always nosy, and I love yeah. to read the acknowledgments. And you say that, and that we're talking about the Bridge of Sighs, you say in this book that though your agent has helped make all of your books better, that he really saved this one. How so? He sure did. Uh, he sure did. Um, I, I have been blessed throughout my career uh, with a kind of stability that not many writers have. I've had one agent and two editors during what now I have to admit is <laughs> getting on a tour towards a fairly long career. Um, and um, when you have that kind of stability, um, um, you know, you get to know your agent pretty well. He gets to know you pretty well. Mm -hmm. Same thing with, mm -hmm. your, with your editors. I had written Bridge of Size uh, all wrong. Um, and 
um, I couldn't quite see it. What I had done was I had told Lucy's story pretty much front to back. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I had told uh, about him, opened with him as an adult, but then went back to his childhood and worked right straight through his, his high school sure. years. Uh -huh. And when I finished with that, then I, then, uh, then I said, all right, now we'll tell the same story through Bobby Marconi's point of mm -hmm. view. And um, so I introduced him in Venice as an adult, 60 years old, went back, captured his um, uh, childhood, and got to see some of the same events that Lucy had already narrated, but now through a very different perspective. Um, and then brought him up to uh, uh, the present again. And then there was a girl that they were both in love yeah. with, of course, yeah. Sarah. Yeah. So uh, it seemed um, uh, it, it seemed like a terrible flaw not to give her a point of view as well. So I started, and then by the time I got to that, I'm about 600 pages into this book, no end in sight. Mm. And um, I gave it, I gave those pages to my agent and said, "What am I working on here? Is this a trilogy? Mm -hmm. Am I suddenly mm -hmm. in Lawrence Durrell territory or something <laughs> here? I, have I?" Uh, uh, what am I doing? Um, and he wrote back and said, um, no, this is one book, but you're taking these things separately and you need to be writing these three major characters, you need to be writing their stories at once, at mm -hmm, the same mm -hmm. time. Um, and so I, I spent about the next hour explaining to him uh, in in excruciating detail why that couldn't be done. <laughs> and as I did, as I explained it to him, why it couldn't be done, it suddenly it dawned on me how, of course, not only it could be done, but it had to be done, that he was yeah. absolutely right, um, that these stories had to alternate. Um, and the only problem that it was going to be was that, that certain information had to be maybe withheld a little bit longer than it, than it was in my original draft. But it, was, but it was perfectly doable, and in fact, it was the only way to mm -hmm. make it one book and not three. You know, one difference I've noticed in this book, it doesn't have your trademark humor as much of it. Yeah. Was yeah. that intentional or did it just, was it just natural to the story? This, this was, no, I think that this was, um, I think that this is a darker book. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there are, there are some funny scenes in it, um, but, but no, it's a darker book. It took me to a darker place. It's really, in, in some ways, it's a book about despair. I think mm -hmm. Lucy... Um, is um, he's told himself over the course of his life, despite that he is married to um, a wonderful woman, mm -hmm. uh, Sarah, uh, and he's lived the life that he has chosen to live. At 60, I think he is, he is coming into a kind mm -hmm. of despairing point in his mm -hmm. life, and in that pivotal scene in Bridge of Sighs, uh, when he goes to um, uh, the junior high school and he looks at his wife's mm -hmm. painting for the first time and he has a kind one of his spells and he gets halfway across that bridge and um, uh, and is thinking about not turning back. Mm -hmm. He's thinking about crossing that bridge. His father stands at the other side and his father of course is dead. And, and um, um, I, um, I think of myself as a fairly optimistic mm -hmm. and cheerful fellow mm -hmm. uh, and yet in order to write Lucy's despair I kind of had to follow him halfway across that bridge myself. I had to understand his despair mm -hmm. and feel his despair. Um, and um, I think that made that a very uh, a very dark book, and it was also written. Uh, frankly, I'm, I don't think of myself as a terribly political writer, but it was but it was written during what for me were the darkest days of the Bush administration, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, I, I had never been more concerned about my nation. Uh, and this is I mean, Bridge of Sighs um, is a, is is also a book um, about. The American Dream, what it, what it was mm -hmm. for for Big Lou, and what it is for Lucy, um, and and what it's um, uh, what it's what it's going to be for the next generation. Of course, that was true for for, for me. Those those boys in that book, um, they're my age, mm -hmm. and and they parallel my experience of being born and growing up in a small town, and um, I was I was drawing on what what. The promise of America was for for my my grandparents um, and for for my for my parents. My father was a D-Day guy, mm -hmm. and um, and 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 how that some of that promise uh, had paid off uh, in in opportunities for me and what America I was going to be mm -hmm. leaving to my daughters, um, and uh, so all of that all of that was playing. And when you, when you're when you're 
lifting that kind of weight humor. <laughs> I think it, maybe it should have had more humor. No, but it just doesn't work. <laughs> but it, does, it, it was, it was uh, the darkest of, of my novels for all those reasons. You also have some allusions to Langston Hughes. Was he a favorite poet of yours? Yeah, very much so. Um, um, I, uh, and uh, uh, shame to admit, um, I, I don't know other black poets, writers nearly as well as I know Hughes's uh, writers, but uh, Hughes's poems. But uh, I also had the the, um, uh, the uh, opportunity to one one day to sit in on a class on one of Langston Hughes's poems. That was one of the best classes. I, I think I was probably a, a mm -hmm. senior professor, mm -hmm. and I was sitting in on a a new faculty member's class to, in order to write an evaluation. And it was one of the most brilliant classes I had ever sat in, and I immediately commandeered that whole lesson <laughs> and gave it to my mad English teacher in, in, uh, in, in this book. But yeah, Hughes, Hughes embodies, too, he's, he's very important, um, I think, as uh, maybe, the, maybe the greatest um, black poet of mm -hmm. the American dream. Yeah, because the he, dream was, he, was, he was. What is it? Well, yeah, but, uh, great. Have your have your American dream. But what about us? Yeah. Uh, uh, what about black people? No, oh, well said. Uh, yeah. Who are your favorite contemporary writers? Oh gosh, um, oh, I hate to answer that question yeah. because my because um, if I don't mention all of my friends and they hear about it. <laughs> That's right. I, I was getting ready to take that. I was going to. I'd spill it. I'd yeah. Spill the no. No. There's. I mean, there's certain writers that um, that you know I, that I, I, I wait for um, uh, wait for their books to come out. Um, um, and uh, I, what I what I like to do more than talk about my favorite writers because I've I, in the last couple of years I've done uh, I've done a couple of judging things which. Um, uh, I was the judge for Best American Short Stories mm -hmm. this year and the year before for uh, Best, the Hemingway uh, Award for Best uh, mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, first Fiction, Book of First Fiction. And so I've spent um, a couple of years discovering some wonderful new writers. And they have a tough, they have a tough road to hoe right now oh, because exactly. uh, with, with fewer, uh, fewer magazines publishing fiction, fewer newspapers, um, uh, doing reviews and those that are still doing reviews are doing fewer reviews there's less advertising for new young writers um, and so I've just been excited by some of the new people out there that are just astonishingly talented that's encouraging uh, to hear yeah yeah, yeah. Um, there's some 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 young writers I mean it's just right off the top of my head uh, uh, Lauren Groff, I think, mm -hmm. is doing wonderful work, and a, and a young writer. Uh, well, actually, I don't know how she how young she is. Rebecca Mackay, um, my friend Jess Walter, who I'm going to be visiting in Spokane in a couple of days. I think his his work is marvelous. Joshua Ferris, Ed Park. I mean, they're all really really good writers, and they're in a they're, the the the, this, the 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 marketplace. I think is is a lot tougher for them than it was for me when I started. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly you've established your place as one of the great American <coughs> writers, won the Pulitzer yeah, Prize for you. Empire yeah. Falls. Wow. I mean, yeah. that's been nearly 10 years ago that you wrote that book. When you look back at it now, is there anything about it that surprises you? That I got the award? No, <laughs> no, the book. Yeah, that, the book. That still continues Does to, it really? That still how continues did, to, how did you to find? How did you find out you won the Pulitzer? Uh, um, well, as you probably know, actually, the Pulitzer was just awarded yesterday, the day before, wasn't it? Um, yeah. This year's. Um, it's the last of the big literary awards, and um, Empire Falls had not been shortlisted for any of the previous awards. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the National Book Award, it wasn't shortlisted for that, or the National Book Critics Circle Award, or the Penn Faulkner. It wasn't actually even so, uh, short, uh, shortlisted for the uh, New England Book Award. So I thought, I, I knew that day that the Pulitzer was going to be announced, but I thought, why hang around and wait for a phone <laughs> that's not going to ring? Uh, <laughs> the ship has sailed, and so I went out and played tennis. With my with my usual partner, and we had a long match that day. And uh, uh, by the time I got home, um, when I pulled in, my wife came out and stood on the porch, and I took one look at her face and knew that either somebody we loved had died or I'd won the Pulitzer. Wanted <laughs> <laughs> you won the Pulitzer. Yeah, yeah. But when you look back at that novel, with ten years mm -hmm. distance, what do you see in it that you might not have seen when you wrote it? I think that I think the Pulitzer um, the Pulitzer Committee likes um, ambitious books, mm -hmm. and um, Empire Falls was I think much like 
a couple of my earlier novels in terms of its length. Might have been a little bit longer, uh, but its it, but its length. Um, um, some the, the the cast of characters, um, blue collar town. Um, all of those things were similar, but but um, Empire Falls had also, in addition to the the, the, the story of, of Miles Roby and his mm -hmm. and his his beloved daughter Tick, and all the, the intimacy of, mm -hmm. of those characters in that small town, there was also. I, I mean, I didn't do it for this purpose, but there was also a kind of mythical context for that story to be taking place in the story of mm -hmm. the Whiting family who had come down through the generations um, from the time that they were first logging on that river and then, then taking over the textile mill and, and taking and being the family that kind of, that kind of ran the town. Um, that, that gave that book uh, a kind of larger social context for the more intimate mm -hmm. story to take, to take mm -hmm. place in. Mm -hmm. um, Again, it was it was taking on a, a, a larger uh, part of the fabric of America and American life, and how and how individual destinies kind of play out in the in the larger social context. And as I look at it now, I, I think to myself, that's the first time I I did that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a novel, provided that larger uh, framework for a story to take place. And I think that probably the poster committee was attracted to that. Mm -hmm. It also became a popular HBO miniseries. Do you yeah. think it worked better as a miniseries than it would have as a feature film? Yeah, one of the first uh, phone calls I got was from Paul Newman, who had gotten the book in galleys. And that he darn said, Paul. Don't, don't, yeah, he said, don't let, don't let him do that. Don't let, don't let him try to. And there were a couple of, um, uh, there were a couple of people interested in trying to do it as a, uh, as a feature-length film. Uh, but that was the first advice I got from Paul, and then not long after that, he called and said, "Actually, let me produce it, <laughs> and we'll take it to HBO." Uh, and that was that was, I think, the best of all worlds for that project. And you did the screenplay, which was probably not the best decision. Um, I, I I adore that um, that miniseries. Uh, the director Fred Skepsi, I think, did, did some of his best work. The cast was unbelievable. Ed Harris was was so fine as Miles Roby. And that wonderful young actress who played Tick, Danielle Pennebaker. I, every, everything about it, uh, almost everything. And I think that the thing that maybe um, I argued at the time, because it had taken me so long to write the book and because I was so exhausted mm. at the, by the time I finished, that maybe fresh eyes would have been a good thing uh, for the screenwriter. That maybe, um, because, you know, I not only adapt my own work, I adapt other writers' work. And if I take a novel um, by another writer, uh, I'm going to look at it with fresh eyes and I'm going to say, all right, this is a movie. Let's see what we might need to do a little differently here to make this, to make this fresh and to make it into, the, into a movie as opposed to just a good novel. And um, um, so I doubted at the time that I had the necessary freshness, that I had the same freshness that Paul Newman had and, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and the director Fred Skepsi had and all that wonderful cast. And I've since wondered, uh, when I look at that, um, what, did, what another screenwriter would have done. Would he have, would he have mm -hmm. found or she have found more different solutions, different kinds of, um, different kinds of transitions? It, once, you've, once you've solved a narrative problem one way, mm -hmm. given, a, given the mm -hmm. next opportunity, you're likely to solve those problems in exactly the same way, whereas fresh eyes might have, might have seeing things a little differently. I don't know. You, well, I wrote it. I'm never going to know. Well, a lot of people really love it. Uh, I, and I'm very proud of it. I, I, myself uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of it. Your latest book is that Old Kate Magic. Yeah. It's, again, it has a, it's funny, it's wonderful. But, Richard, shortly <laughs> after it was published, <laughs> uh, Newsweek had this review. You know yeah, the one I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you a misogynist? And I've got to say that 99.9% .9 of all the other critics refuted that totally. Mm -hmm. But as a writer, how do you handle that kind of thing when you work so hard on your books and, and, and something like that comes up? Well, um, the, the, the line I took at the time, which I, which I think is the correct one, um, is um, that um, a writer spends an awful lot of time writing a book like Bridge of Size or that old Cape Magic or Empire Falls. Uh, you spend a lot of time on it, and you build it uh, with the best materials you can, and you use all your skills to to um, uh, to make this thing. Uh, once you've made it, it has to stand on its own. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't go out and defend it in the world. I, back when I was teaching, I used to tell my, tell my, um, my students in workshop, um, a student would turn in a story and then people would start teeing off on it uh, and saying, here's what's wrong with it, here's what's wrong with it. And, and the author would always want to say, wait, say, wait a second, that's not true. And I always said to, to, the, to the author of the story, wait, you don't get to talk. You had your chance. You wrote the story. Now, whether or not this criticism is justified, you have to you have to listen to it. You have to hear what the other people are saying, um, and and because in fact you only get one chance. And my feeling was when this charge was made, uh, if you can expect that of an undergraduate, if you can expect an undergraduate to keep his or her mouth shut uh, and recognize that the only chance you have to defend yourself is the book. The book has to defend, to, to defend itself against charges. Um, and so um, my, my, feeling, my feeling was to just let, let the book, if there's evidence in the book, um, then let the book defend itself. Well, are all your great female characters that you've yeah. written throughout the years that are just wonderful. We just have under a minute left. Is it true you're writing a sequel to Nobody's Fool? <laughs> it's slowly, slowly <laughs> coming back. Uh, well, Yes, um, the rumor is true. Uh, I'm, I, I'm hoping to get started very soon uh, on uh, a new novel that takes place in North Bath. Um, I don't think Sully will be the main character. He'll be a character in it. I'm very anxious to uh, see what he's up to these days because I'm sure it's no good. Um, and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to going back to that world. I think the main character this time may be that dumb cop. Well, we'll look forward to it. Thank you so much for being here, Richard. I enjoyed it. And Thank you for inviting me. Congratulations on your new granddaughter. Yeah, that's really exciting. That's really <laughs> exciting. And thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.